All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Hi, my name is Laura DeVoe, and I'm one of the uh, members of the Build the Era Advisory Board. Um, and I'm in Newton, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. If this is your first time at a Build the Era event, please put it up in the chat and introduce yourself. Love to hear from you and make sure we are welcoming um, anyone who might be new. Um, and if you are not new, tell us uh, why you're coming back for more. So that'd be great. Um, Build the Era um, is an education and advocacy organization that's focused on transportation and infrastructure as it relates to the Department of Transportation. Uh, volunteers uh, founded and power this organization. Um, and these volunteers come from uh, the Pete Buttigieg 2020 presidential campaign, as well as folks from the Biden-Harris campaign who found their way to this group um, and others. Um, <clears throat> our purpose is to connect citizens from across America to the DOT by um, education um, and by educating and informing the public as to what the DOT does and does not do and why it matters. Um, educating and informing the public to the role that infrastructure plays in America's quality of life. Uh, providing training and guidance on how to engage with local and federal elected officials, which are gonna be extremely important. Um, and finally, providing training and guidance on how to advocate by using relational organizing as a primary tool. Um, we're very happy you're here, and I really uh, want to thank all of you for being here. And Cindy, welcome to your first event. This is great. Hey, Cindy. Turn things back over to, is Jeannie here? Yeah. Okay. I'm here. Hey, Jonathan. Hold here. it over to Jeannie. So if you've been with us, we did this uh, Learn About DOT in four parts. The first one was about climate, big uh, thorny issue. Then we talked about safety. And then this is part three, equity and restoring justice or social equity. And the fourth one coming up will be jobs, 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 jobs. So um, just wanted to uh, welcome everybody. And um, we arrange ourselves around these um, kind of a construct of regions this is the FTA regions and I'm in region 10 and my cohort in transportation, Jonathan is in region one in Maine. Um, and we like to talk about all kinds of things transportation wise. I wanted to start off by talking about how great transportation is. It gets you around. Transportation connects people to opportunities, school, work, shopping, you know, dinner, recreation, family and events. And transportation connects all of our goods and services. Uh, we've seen the stress that has been put on that system, and uh, we know how important it is, but also intrinsically transportation is tied with land use, and, uh, and that drives the economy. So um, what we've seen during the pandemic is some of these things, school, work, shopping, and even uh, Grubhub can be done on another kind of uh, uh, superhighway, the, uh, uh, the information superhighway has been replaced and then also um, how we pay for things and how we do our jobs was not uh, necessarily linked to a transportation system and in in that way i want to make sure everybody understands that infrastructure doesn't have to be a thing that the car drives on so uh, we hear that over and over again um, i also wanted to introduce people to the the if you haven't heard of the triple bottom line which is um, people planet and profit, and if these, it's a business way of looking at things. If people feel that these are working, people and profit, equitable, people and planet is bearable, planet and profit, if those things are working together, if all of these three things are working together, we'll have a sustainable economy. So just, you know, you know just recognizing that it is, um, all works together. And see, uh, the effects of transportation in our first learn about, we talked about the, you know, just what is the DOT? We saw that the expansion of rail re resulted in the near extinction of the American buffalo or American bison. It uh, result after the, prom the golden spike and promontory point, uh, uh, the, the rail expansion resulted in exclusion of Chinese being, you know, then the Chinese Exclusion Act the land appropriated was given to robber barons. The interstate completion, division of low income communities, air quality, lead and air and water impacts to habitat. And then the sprawl that we've experienced more recently, which is 
creates costly infrastructure, land use impacts, air quality, and there's a disproportionate impact to low income and black and brown communities. The infrastructure barriers that we've uh, built also become barriers to those with disabilities. So there are some pretty substantial negative impacts, effects of transportation as well. <clears throat> That's what we wanna talk about. So the tools for providing equity in transportation, moving towards freedom from bias or favoritism include the 1970 National Environmental Protection Act, which includes, um, was followed on by states. So NEPA covers certain things, the states covered other things. In Washington state, we have SEPA, California has CEQA, other states have environmental um, regulations as well. And in 1996, they also adopted something called a community impact assessment, just another tool, making sure that what we're doing in transportation and infrastructure is um, it does good things and not bad things. Uh, in 1994, um, we'll talk about this, Bill Clinton signed the Environmental Justice uh, Executive Order, and that resulted in different ways of looking at, you know, bringing in data to look at how disproportionate things are. And then the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Department of Justice oversees this, and it, uh, it talks about the injunctive relief against discrimination in places of public accommodation. In 1990, that resulted in requirements for ADA transition plans. A lot of agencies haven't done it. It is a bit of a hardship, but um, you know, it, it's a long arc. Uh, the, the arc of moral justice is long, but it bends toward justice. So um, what is NEPA? We talked about carrots and sticks and mostly NEPA, a little bit of a stick. Um, what triggers it? What's that nexus? What, what makes, uh, puts NEPA into play? Uh, we'll talk about the NEPA process, which includes defining a purpose and need. And that's, a, that's an important thing I want people to um, tie into. It's a foundational piece of NEPA. Uh, it's where you can engage and maybe make a project better. Um, they require that you look at a broad range of solutions, identify the impacts of those, define mitigation, and that's when the approval should come. The elements of the environment, what, what gets studied, there's a big long list. And this is the long list that was studied for, for that I-45 project in Houston. We're gonna to touch on that with Jonathan um, and talk about you know, possibly a case study of how things might not go well. But you can see they looked at a, they looked at a community impact assessment, did a lot of public involvement and, and, and they are at an impact. Uh, NEPA processes, <clears throat> this is what that process looks like. This is from uh, ABCs of SEPA and NEPA, one of my favorite documents. It shows that the nexus for triggering or forcing you to do uh, NEPA is this uh, federal nexus, which means you're either using federal dollars or you're requiring a federal permit. Federal permits are for uh, if you're impacting waters of the United States, shorelines, uh, wetlands, things like that. Um, uh, defining this purpose and need statement. That's like I said, critical. How we define significant impacts, significant. The word significant is very, um, it's a kind of an important word to track. Uh, is it unavoidable? Is it adverse? Are there cumulative and secondary impacts? Um, and this just shows that, uh, you know, a lighter touch on NEPA, categorical exemption. You might require federal funds, but it's an easy thing. There's no impacts, no significant impacts. Uh, you can get your uh, approvals right away. So what is the statement of purpose and need? This is a really important thing. Um, and I, I encourage people to get in, in on the ground floor. <laughs> Every effort should be made to develop a concise purpose and need statement that focuses on the primary transportation challenges that need to be addressed. This is like the mission statement for, um, for a project. And it should be very short and succinct, a page long. The key thing is it shouldn't be presupposing what the answers are. It shouldn't define what the alternative should be. So for example, you've been planning forever to do light rail uh, along a corridor. When you get to the federal process, FTA's process, and create a purpose and need, it should say the need is something related to, we have congestion, we wanna uh, protect our environment and air quality. There's a lot of people that need to go from here to there and we wanna study it. It shouldn't say, we want to build this uh, Linwood to Seattle light rail link. <laughs> so it, because it, it makes the, the process a little bit more expansive, allows the community to look at broader set of alternatives. 
I should not presuppose what the solution is. What is significance? Um, typically, significance is around these couple four things, and they determine what kind of document. So if there's um, agency and public controversy is high, I worked on a project where they were building a, um, a, a deep water port, they're expanding a deep water port and, uh, so that they could sh ship more coal to uh, Asia. And believe me, <laughs> um, that was one of the most controversial projects I worked on. 7,000 people showed up for these public meetings, uh, putting tolls on I-90 where there are no tolls today. I had uh, public meetings where about 1,000 people showed up. So that would put you in the EIS category, a bigger document, a more substantial uh, look at things. Significance of the impacts, if they're greater, um, you know, uh, if, if it's a wide swath of freeway, like you'll see on I-45, that's a substantial impact. If the extent of mitigation is, is also big, meaning you're, you're gonna have to restore wetlands four to one, um, that, that too is a, big, is a big deal. And then the range of alternatives. I have a project right now, and it's not a really big project, but there are a number of alternatives that also puts it in this category of you should give it a good review, a good wire brushing, a good uh, uh, assessment of, uh, of the environment. Um, and then what are mitigations and remedies? So avoid it, um, meaning don't do it or move it to somewhere else, minimize it, reduce the footprint. In the case of I-45, or I'll, uh, an example here, um, the 520 floating bridge, they looked at a six lane section, which would add an HOV lane and an eight lane section that would add not only HOV lanes, but also uh, an additional general purpose lane. And in that case, the impacts were so great, they decided to reduce the footprint to the six lane section. Uh, restoring, and I talked about wetlands. A lot of times if you're impacting pristine wetlands, um, you'll, you'll have to replace them at maybe one to four. So if you impact an acre of wetlands, you'll have to restore four acres of wetlands. Uh, maybe the impact is gonna be reduced over time. If you could say that the trees will grow back, your hair will grow back, <laughs> um, or for potentially you're moving towards zero emission vehicles. Maybe we don't have to worry about uh, air quality if we know that um, in the future we'll be moving to transit only, for example. And then compensation, you'll see this in I-45. Anything you're doing to displace or, um, or take away homes uh, and relocate, that's, uh, you'll have to compensate folks for that. And again, is that mitigation? Who knows? Um, there are state processes for everything that falls through. It doesn't require a federal, uh, federal nexus. It doesn't require federal, it doesn't use federal dollars and it doesn't require federal permits. In Washington state, that's everything else. Um, land use actions, uh, transportation actions. And why do we look at all of those things? Well, you know, work out. <laughs> we want to create a you know a good environment to um, save our species and our our quality of life. NEPA and social justice and equity. Um, you know what is what works here um, for very large infrastructure investments. It triggers this federal process. It brings all these people into the process to Department of Justice uh, for civil rights issues and environmental justice. Um, it'll bring in um, National Marine Fisheries. You'll bring in uh, a lot of different regulatory agencies that are going to review these things, and if, especially if you need a permit. So it, it brings a lot of um, a lot of uh, oversight. It requires expansive analysis, sets thresholds for impact, sets the audience, including the regulators, and it helps to define the mitigation. But the analysis should note how the comments are addressed. So if you write a comment, they will say your comment was addressed here. Um, and then there's processes that include opportunities for appeal. What could be better? The outreach and engagement. If you, like me, um, are a busy mom, you don't have time to go to these public meetings or provide comments, but um, the greater effort should be made to reach out to, especially communities that are typically disadvantaged. And you don't wanna you know, overwhelm um, moms that have kids and kids that are in Zoom school. But what you can do is work through uh, local agencies that, that work closely with them. In our case, um, we're doing a lot of things like working with churches. We have a Filipino specific Filipino church and we're gonna work with, uh, for example, the minister there to make sure that um, you know, we are getting a uh, broad range of input. input. 
Um, measure, methods don't measure or assess affected communities. Sometimes there aren't good data. The data is limited and not fine-grained enough to do these assessments. The bigger thing is it takes a long time. You'll see in I-45, they started a decade or more ago, 20 years ago, on that project. And philosophies change, you know, um, approach to things change, people's beliefs change. So uh, these processes take a long time and things could be better. Um, environmental justice was an executive order signed by President Clinton in 1994. And specifically, it identified, um, it required identification and addressing the disproportionately, that's a very important word, high and adverse human health or environmental effects of actions on minority low income populations to the greatest extent practicable and permitted by law. So you have to show evidence that you didn't pick a solution uh, just because, or you didn't, your solution doesn't um, disproportionately affect low income and minorities. And, and you picked a solution that um, there are other solutions that, uh, that have impacts on other, you know, maybe higher income folks. So you have to do this analysis. And what does, uh, what works in that? The threshold for disproportionate sometimes is, um, is a, you know, it, it can be um, confusing or it can be not, uh, not well-defined. Right-of-way purchases are something that they look deeply at, Department of Justice um, and civil rights. And then what could work better somewhat, it depends on the rigor of the regulators, looks closely at the right-of-way impacts, but not broadly at the community impact. I worked on a project and this was the only little um, Hispanic grocery store and we were moving it a couple of blocks away. Was it, was it gonna be now uh, inaccessible or were communities gonna be impacted and not have access to this kinds of um, these ethnic uh, foods? Um, and then there's a community impact assessment and that's kind of a new tool. Um, uh, it's something that you could do independently. I've seen it done. Um, in the, like um, people will say, our community group is going to do this. We're going to hire someone to do this because we're concerned about how um, how the state or DOT or whoever are doing this analysis. It it is a process um, that looks not just at the project but holistically at an area to develop the community profile. It looks at the demographics, social history, land use, and it analyzes the impacts based on the whole area. So it's a little bit more takes a different perspective. And they too identify these types of solutions. So for example, if the alternative is this, you know, goes through a park, uh, maybe you, you would avoid it by going around it or minimizing it or uh, identifying some mitigation over here, like adding park so that this isn't so bad or adding park and enhancing this roadway so it has the least amount of impact and then documenting it. Uh, sometimes that works, um, it's preemptive. It defines disproportionate for displacement that can be used in concert with environmental justice, which is an element of the environment that has to be studied um, in NEPA. Uh, it's broad and inclusive community. It's, sometimes it could be you know, better at getting that broad inclusive community feedback. The folks who are writing the community impact assessment might not be as thorough in reaching out to folks, uh, setting the thresholds or measures, what is acceptable or if mitigation is required. And then now another kind of a little bit different than the environmental process is this is a, under civil rights and overseen by the Department of Justice is these ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and specifically Title II, which is the ADA transition plan. And this is a kind of, a, you know, what's called universal design. The classic is, hey, uh, could you please shovel the ramp for me? Um, all these other kids are waiting, you know, the uh, support staff is saying, um, I'm gonna clear the stairs and then I'll clear the ramp. And he says, but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. So the notion is, you know, clear the path, <laughs> clear the ramp and everybody can have access. Um, the ADA transition plans, uh, most jurisdictions should have these, if not all, they're required to have them. They've been required to have them since 1990. It should, act, uh, it should um, note, that uh, there's access to all public programs and places. So if you're at a public meeting, they should, you know, there should be access to uh, uh, hearing devices, uh, uh, augmentation to hear, um, you know, speeches and things. Um, there should be a process for modifying policies that deny equal access. 
there should be effective communication procedures, making sure you reach the broadest uh, community and uh, regardless of disabilities. There should be an ADA coordinator, someone I can go to if I, um, if I need, um, if I have a complaint about something. And then there should be public notices uh, of ADA requirements and the grievance procedure. If you, you know, if you wanna complain about a sidewalk that's not well maintained or blocked. So in our lifetime, we will all likely need some type of accommodation. So we should all care about this. Uh, in this case, you know, um, the, the, it looks like it works, right? Uh, it has the little pad and whatnot, but the button might not be uh, meeting current standards. This is an interesting case in um, uh, Bellingham. It looks right, except the driver, if they're uh, disabled, can't get out into a wheelchair. <laughs> One of the complaints we got, this is obviously a sidewalk, which is um, broken and a trip hazard. And um, obviously no one can get through there. Uh, especially if you have a stroller or in a wheelchair. And uh, one of the things we heard complaints about uh, was these sandwich boards that they are in the way if you're blind and you know a path and then you know one day there's this uh, sandwich board in the way. Um, so the city worked on making sure that there was guidance of where those could be placed. And obviously if there's no curb ramp um, and you're in a wheelchair or have a wheeled device you can't um, access, it's a barrier to access. Uh, in public rights of way, there's a uh, guidance called the Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidance PROAG uh, by the US Access Board. And this was adopted for ADA uh, in 2014. Before that, between 1990 and 2014, it was kind of a, a no man's land. We, there was a patchwork of guidance. So you might wonder, you know, these, this was Pat, the title ADA transition plans were adopted in 1990. How can we still have these problems? Um, but it addresses curb ramps, sidewalks, traffic signals, and those push buttons, crosswalks, uh, the signals for those, the detectable warnings. And then um, if you live in a place like where I live, where there are steep slopes in, uh, in our downtown, there you, you might not be able to meet the slopes uh, required for curb ramps or even sidewalks. And you have to you know, note especially if you're building anything new, you have to, uh, you can build it to the maximum extent feasible. You know, you can try to do whatever you can, and then you have to document why you couldn't meet um, ADA. And then it's a lot of documentation, progress over time. Um, the, uh, what it's a slow removal of barriers and what could work better, you know, the standards change over time. So now that they have this pro egg, maybe there'll be some uniformity going forward. I hear from um, disabled folks, um, those crosswalks, for example, they work for some people that are sight impaired, but sometimes people that are hearing impaired do not, you know, they don't work for them. So the design standards, they're gonna change over time and we're gonna be in this constant process of updating. Um, the other thing is, you know, we've built all this infrastructure over the last decades, 100 years or so, and some of it meets and, and a lot of it doesn't. But what, um, what you need to do as part of your ADA transition plan is reach out to those, the community, especially the community with disabilities or supporting people with disabilities and ask them what are their priorities. Um, we, we do this and we ask, you know, where do you wanna, what's the most important? Is it shopping? Is it transit? Is it parks? Um, and that's where we, that's where we uh, put our funding. Um, and then I'm going to turn this over to Jonathan in a minute, but just wanted to take a quick history. Again, this I-45 project that we've all been tracking in Houston, Texas, uh, they've been working on this for a long time. This is the one where Pete stepped in to say, you know, could you take another look? And I'm going to backtrack a tiny bit on the, if anybody noticed the, the Dakota, that was the, um, the, I saw this morning that the, or just now that the, the um, Dakota Access Pipeline, they, you know, they're gonna throw in the towel on that. And it had been such a controversy for years. You, you had people um, in the Standing Rock Sioux saying, you know, we didn't want this pipeline across our land. Um, it was such a controversy and everybody wondered, a lot of people might've wondered, why didn't Obama say, stop it? Um, 
Biden did step up and say, take another look. Um, but I think with Obama, we put these big thorny processes out there. The Dakota Access Pipeline went through all those processes. It got all the way through the courts. It's withstood appeals. And I don't think uh, Obama saying, you know, don't do it would be saying, um, I'm breaking my own law. So I think that's, you know, that's the challenges that uh, th these are not easy decisions. And in this case, uh, I-45 has been around for a long time. It has a lot of weight moving it forward. And in the midst of uh, the process, um, there were a lot of actions, but Metro um, m delivered the, a light rail line in the middle of the process. Um, this is that infamous purpose and need statement. And I want people to look at this. So the need was based on existing congestion, future traffic growth that might or might not occur. Uh, aging infrastructure, so they have some kind of a, a design problem with the existing infrastructure and um, outdated design elements. They don't talk about the fact that you know they they want, might be changing to they, they it, the project they had includes carpool facilities. Maybe they don't need carpool facilities. Maybe they need to take the bigger leap toward transit. Um, and they added in their maintain effective evacuation routes. And so you'll see. Flooding is a big issue. Hurricane Harvey flooded half of the homes in this one development that's um, that's it, it very controversial. It's where they're going to be um, uh, acquiring a lot of right away, relocating folks. And um, FEMA look, you know, noted this was a floodplain or flooded area. Um, so they realigned the highway to go through some of this area, and they thought that was a great idea. And they're hearing now <laughs> that it is not. Uh, what what changed? The initial emphasis was on congestion, uh, and they had HOV versus transit, and they had this emphasis of uh, moving through, um, not to or from. But they did a ton of study. So here's where I'd like to turn it over to Jonathan, if he's here. Alrighty. So, as you can see, Jeannie, Jeannie had mentioned they studied, you know, quite a bit of, you know, basically the stuff that they need to go over as part of the NEPA process. You know, that whole list of things. Um, but what's what's interesting about this whole thing, and I would ask Jeannie, would it be possible for me to be able to present real quick here? Because I'm pulling I pulled up something interesting. I'd like folks to see. I think the, I made you co-host, didn't I? Yeah, this will be real quick here. There you go. I'm assuming Jeannie's okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of interesting. Um, there's a tool that the EPA has called EJ Screen. It's their environmental justice screening and mapping tool. And if you just look at this, and I'll show you why this matters here in a second, um, but you can see um, and then I, can you folks see my mouse okay moving around here? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can see this area right here, um, you know, and, and if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the color coding over here, you can see that we're talking, you know, some really low income neighborhoods, you know, I mean, this is, this has been the history of freeways and, you know, dividing these communities. But let me just show you, let's go to the actual plan. And you can see kind of where that goes. So let's, uh, let me get down here. So that's what we're looking at right here. They've got a, it's, it's marked right now um, as potential detention area, but this is a housing neighborhood right here. So let me, let me bring that screen back. So here you go, you know, like a low income neighborhood going right through the middle of it and wiping out the housing districts here. And then if you go further up here, um, there's this area called the White Oak Bayou Greenway Trail. And I just want to show you what that looks like now. So you look around here. This is what people are seeing now. Here's the highway right here. I mean, you've got some, you know, some uh, elevated freeway going over the top here. But for the most part, you've got a fairly decent buffer. 
you know, and you've got a nice kind of green space. You've got the bayou, you know, right here to look at, to walk along. And again, let's go back to what's being proposed here in this area. Now picture this with five lanes over the top of it. Hmm. And picture the roadway getting even closer right next to the bayou. Oh, wow. So, you know, you can just, you can visualize it. And then let's go back to this here. If you see, this is, this is, you've got the University of Houston downtown, you've got a metro rail, you've got connections. Basically, this is connecting a low income community, you know, to the university and to downtown Houston. And now it's being split through with an elevated highway. So this is very similar to the I-81 um, piece in Syracuse, really, when it was first, uh, we talked about that, I think, in the, in the initial uh, uh, webinar. Um, you know, we had talked about how the, the state had gone in and, and had taken this low income area. And, and let me put on this too, the, the population um, compared for the state here. I mean, you do have, you know, a fairly significant um, population with people of color. So, you know, low income people of color, this has been the historic issue um, that freeways have come in and divided and destroyed these communities. So just looking at it from a private citizen, it's hard to say that that's not happening again. You know, it's, it's hard to straight face that. So I just, I wanted to show that illustration real quick to, to show people kind of what, you know, what people are, you know, what the community again is seeing, you know, through their eyes and, and what's happening here. So um, you can go, I'm gonna stop sharing, Jeannie, if you could pick it back up again here. Jonathan, can I ask you a question real quick? Yeah. Uh, while you have this, uh, there's the physical division, the possible destruction of homes and relocation, there, there are those issues. But even for those that remain, there's certainly gonna be a lot of health issues. We know exactly. that. We know that historically. I mean, none of us have to be doctors to realize uh, that there's issues. Does that not play into this decisioning at all? It should. I mean, you know, that, that's the, the, you know, there's a hazardous materials piece. There's air quality. I mean, air quality is noted there, you know, and, and there's certain things that, um, you know, state DOTs have to go through to prove that, you know, they're taking air quality into account. Um, but there are still things that don't go far enough. So, you know, it, there's, if we can, we can go to the, um, if you could jump to the, not the EJ screen, but the next one, Jeannie. So this is, this is kind of what the trade-offs are um, for the community and, and what they're seeing. Um, you know, the, the environmental impact statements noting a displacement of 160 family, uh, single family homes, 433 multifamily units, 486 public and low income housing units, 344 businesses, five places of worship and two schools. So this is a huge impact to the communities that, that this is, you know, we're kind of tearing through. Um, the city has actually, you know, the Texas DOT has come out and said that they're going to, as part of the, part of the um, record of decision and the environmental impact statement, that they're going to put 27 million toward the affordable housing initiative because they're going through and, you know, and tearing out these housing developments. But the city's actually pointed out that building costs the way they are it's going to cost, you know, potentially 122 million is what they're figuring. Right. So you're, you're, you're almost like 100 million short. Um, the mayor, because you've got two complexes in here, you've got Clayton Homes complex, which I had just pointed out, that was the part that was being completely obliterated. And then you've got um, what's called the Kelly Village apartment complex. And that would part of that would be demolished. Um, there are replacements to um, replace it and relocate people. Um, for the Clayton Homes, they're promising 80% would be relocated within two miles. And then as far as the Kelly Village apartments, there's no real commitment in there, just that there's, they'd be nearby. There's no specific, you know, two miles or anything like that. And the mayor, he originally supported the project in, 2020, in May 2020, but then he issued another letter in December of 2020 saying he couldn't continue to endorse it unless they studied a narrow footprint, expanded transit options, 
retained and expanded local street connectivity. And the city had actually made comments on the community impact statement and cumulative impacts technical report. And they're, they're claiming that they weren't addressed. And that's required by NEPA to, to have that go through. And then there was supposedly a memorandum of understanding between Texas DOT and the Houston Galveston area council, their, their transportation policy council, um, were supposed to come up with a memorandum of understanding. And that was you know, kind of a legal the binding document um, that, and there were things that he wanted addressed in that, like keeping communities whole, ensuring residents could relocate within their neighborhoods. I just mentioned the fact that there really wasn't a commitment for part of that, um, you know, and, and making sure that the frontage roads as part of this would have the separated bike lanes. And then here's the third one, reducing visual impacts along that bayou stretch. Um, you know, that, that's a big pedestrian cyclist area. And like I said, you've got five elevated sections that are going to go over the top of that thing. So it's, I'm not sure what could be done for mitigation, but mm -hmm. you know, that, that really is going to change that area when that happens. And unfortunately, there was no um, memorandum of understanding between Texas DOT and the Houston Galveston Area Council. Um, what happened was Texas DOT lawyers basically would not allow their agency to sign it. So the council went forth with a non-binding resolution and it narrowly squeaked by but, and the majority who voted for it were of no surprise the people who were in the suburban areas surrounding the city, not within the area that was affected itself. So, you know, that's, that's kind of something, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the playbook that we've seen before, you know, it's a lot of times. So, um, you know, obviously this has caused a lot of controversy um, and it, you can see the community response, you know, that, that it's not gonna fix congestion. It's not gonna make it, you know, easier to move about the city you know, and it's going to destroy neighborhoods and it's going to continue the systemic racism that we've seen as part of these projects moving through. So if we go to the next slide here, this is, you know, it has created quite a bit of uh, controversy. Oh. And you've got, you know, you've got um, right now, you have federal, you have civil rights complaints, you know, so the federal highway has now stepped in and there's claims that this is essentially violating, violating Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And what that is, it, is it's saying that no person on, in the United States shall on the ground of race, color, or national origin be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So you have all these relocations, this compensation. So you know, naturally, you know, Title VI is something that they're, they're claiming that has been violated. So Harris County has, has, so while FHWA has asked them to pause and they're investigating, Harris County has actually sued um, Texas DOT and asking a federal court to revoke the record of decision. The thing, the document that essentially tells them they can move forward, um, claiming that they did not consider the full environmental impact of the project. And meanwhile, the city of Houston did its whole own, its own public outreach and everything to everybody getting ideas in. They had um, one, you know, keeping the highway where it was, but just maintaining the current footprint and just upgrading the safety um, within the highway structures itself. Um, you know, and there were some claims in the process too that the right of way piece of this whole thing when looking at property and how much property would be impacted when the first round of alternatives went through kind of the elimination process. There were claims that basically right away was only considered when it was looked at for high income bracket neighborhoods. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of claims being made here that, that the process wasn't really followed. So, you know, that's why federal highway is stepping in and, and taking a look to see if, you know, if indeed, um, and, and, the, and why Harris County has gone forth with a lawsuit. So, you know, this, this still has quite a saga and a long way to go, but this is an example of why, you know, we need programs in the American Jobs Plan, you know, and, and Jeannie will get to those here next on, you know, what's in there to try to, you know, mitigate this line of thinking and, and the consequences of it um, from occurring. Laura, you had a quick comment? I just wanted to note that um, some of this uh, actually lines up really well. If you haven't seen the um, webinar we did on uh, getting behind local and state initiatives, 
um, uh, the Senate, the state senator uh, who hosted us uh, for that was talking about Springfield, Massachusetts. And when you were speaking about um, the environmental uh, concerns and things like um, uh, how it affects people's health, um, Springfield is the asthma capital of the world. And part of the reason for that is the city is cut up by all these highways and the, you know, just the pollution and everything. So it, it, I think it's important for those who haven't seen the other videos, um, you know, we have some very applicable stuff. And as with, uh, we all learned from Pete's campaign, everything's connected. Um, so, uh, you know, when you have health inequities, and you have transportation inequities and you have infrastructure inequities, they all kind of lay it on top of each other and it only makes it worse. So um, that was what my, my quick point was. Another thing I'm just gonna point out too is what's really interesting in this is Texas DOT signed the record of decision. In a lot of places, the feds signed the record of decision. I was in just gonna mention that because I, yeah. I saw that and I was like, wait a minute, I, I was looking for a federal highway signature and I didn't see one. Right. They have the authority in Texas. They have so many freeways and blah blah blah. They, so in the they have the authority to sign their own record of decision, which is makes you wonder why do they have these processes? And that is why they should get you know that is a something to consider now is should FHWA be the final signer? Um, because anywhere else it is an independent review, right? Uh, Texas DOT they've been looking at this project for twenty years, and <laughs> of course it's. You know, it's got so much momentum within the Texas DOT that they, they moved it along and signed off on the record of decision. The Fox and the Hen House are all in good, in good stead. Yeah, um, just to say, too, the public comment period was only 30 days, and basically they moved from mm -hmm. signing off on it. They, they closed comment in December, and they signed off on the record of decision right in early February. So that, yeah. that, that is like lightning, lightning quick in, in the NEPA world. For something that's controversial, like our gateway coal terminal, I mean, that was <laughs> months of public meetings. It would have, and it stopped it. It stopped it in its track. Uh, so yeah, that it's interesting. And, uh, you know, it's like the Department of Justice when they step in to oversee your police department, it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a wire brushing. <laughs> they're going to, they're going to give you a lot of scrutiny. Um, enter Joe Biden. <laughs> So, uh, at, you know, it starts at the top, the executive order I-13-98 or 1-3985 signed on inauguration day. It's um, through the federal government. It's the first executive order uh, and it advances racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. Hallelujah, right? Um, and starting with the raise grant, that was something that was advertised about a month ago called the Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity. These used to be called Tiger Grants during the um, Obama administration when we were in the ARA recovery era. Um, but now they're, uh, and I think during the uh, Trump administration, they were called BUILD. These, uh, the RAISE grants, it's, a, it's a federal dollars that go to infrastructure. This grant is due July 11th, but it states specifically, you know, investing in projects that either proactively address racial equity and barriers to opportunity, including automobile dependence as a form of barriers to opportunity or redress prior inequities. A lot of the things that, um, you know, that, that project in Syracuse that was gonna restitch a community back together. It's got a billion dollars. They want half of it to go to rural areas. And in rural areas, as you might know, they don't have a lot of planning dollars to put forth or the rural areas really, um, you know, could use some help, especially in planning and, uh, and, and, and in their infrastructure, they have a lot of failing bridges. 10 million would be awarded local uh, in benefiting areas of persistent poverty, at least 10 million. Um, it allows grants for planning, which is not normal. And that's really a help and assistance to those, um, those communities um, you know, that don't have money for planning, rural areas, tribes, um, uh, areas of persistent poverty. And, um, and then it targets at least 40% in overburdened communities. <clears throat> so that's um, so that's the raise grant, and then the original AGP, AJP, and equity, which I say the original because we know it, you know it'll change. But it included 20 billion for reconnecting the neighborhoods, uh, just like the one we talked about earlier uh, in Syracuse. 45 billion 
to remove lead pipes. Uh, I don't know how much more equitable that could be. 56 billion for low cost flexible loans to states, tribes, territories, and disadvantaged communities. This is loans so that they can do some repair and restoration of their infrastructure. 100 billion so that we have 100% high speed internet at affordable prices. Uh, you know, we, we all know how important broadband is. 60 billion to help plug those oil and gas wells and those uh, disproportionately impact low income colors of community and then build that next generation industries in distressed communities. The 10 billion civilian climate crawl to stay when I was growing up a hundred years ago, but in, in um, uh, the federal government used to offer something called CETA, the CETA program. And that would, um, you know, that would give job, summer jobs to kids, inner city kids, what we used to call inner city kids, keep them in a job that was, you know, uh, a good job, a reasonable job, and not finding other work with um, in the drug trade. And this, you know, Ronald Reagan got rid of a lot of those CETA programs. This would restore some of those, give kids, uh, young people, opportunities to be a positive impact on the climate. 213 billion for 2 million homes, upgrade VA hospitals. Most, um, there are a lot of people that their only health insurance comes through the VA. Um, and, um, and those are you know, low income folks. 100 billion to modernize public schools. And that's not my school where I have a very nice school down the street. Those are that a lot of that money would go to um, underserved community, communities and under, uh, underdeveloped schools. And then 25 billion to upgrade and increase childcare. So important to get and help women um, in the work, re-enter the work world. world. And then uh, partnerships with rural and tribal communities, 10 billion for research and development for HBCUs and other uh, colleges that um, in STEM fields. So I think it, it's, um, every time I read it, I think it's amazing. We'll open it up for questions. Sorry, that probably went a little long. Uh, we actually have a few questions sitting here. Uh, let me just, let's see if we can do a lightning round. How's that? Um, does Harris County have a legal authority to block or question anything when the project is totally within the city of Houston? What is their purview on that? They can appeal. Huh? I think they can appeal. The, uh, yeah, I think their their main thing is basically just trying to get the court to trying to get essentially the federal, you know, some sort of action to try to get this thing overturned. So they're, they're trying to take any legal means, you know, they're obviously hearing from the people that live, you know, in the area and want to try to do something to help. In the Clayton Homes, I don't know if that's Clayton Homes, the mobile home uh, builder, or if that's a different name, but it, I guess I should ask that question first. Is that the is that a public housing development or is that a, a builder? It's a housing development. It's it's that okay. area that we talked about. Um, that Jeannie's got it here, right here. You okay. see the, you know, essentially the, the freeway and the detention area that's uh, noted. Well, Jennifer that's, has, a, that's, has a good question then related to that is, is, is HUD involved in, in this? I think I'm not really sure. I know they're going through the Houston Housing Authority, um, but I don't know if, if HUD is involved with this. You know, and the real challenge is if you if you challenge this, you're challenging, did they do a thorough job? Did they write enough inches of paper? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you know, and some and you're gonna have to find a really substantial issue but that they didn't cover some of these they didn't address some of these issues so that's right. that's what i when i talk about significance that's that's some of the challenges um it could be just controversial enough that it it puts a um uh, puts the brace on this but did they do did they create inches and inches of paper did they do a thorough job did you know they spend millions on this environmental document absolutely one of the things uh, we've talked about this before, uh, Jonathan and, and Jeannie both, for those of us that are not in this world, uh, uh, could you give a little context? Um, this was pretty, what Pete did in stopping this project was pretty monumental, wasn't it? That's, can you speak to that? You know, that's why I, and uh, Jonathan, I'd love to hear from you. 
that's why I bring up the Dakota Access Pipeline. There were people, you know, standing, ready to stand in front of bulldozers in that case. And, and President Obama, you know, he stood back because he, he, this was a, a process that had, you know, had run its course. It was very hard for him to say, uh, I'm just gonna go rogue and go against my processes that are already in place and say, you shouldn't do this. Now, the minute Joe Biden came into office, he said, I don't think you should do that project and they're stopping it. I think what uh, 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 Pete in his wealth of knowledge, he's asking them to reconsider, go back to, go back to a table find a solution that makes everybody look good. And he's really good at that. And I think he knows, you know, that's a, instead of, instead of blowing this up into a very, you know, um, uh, I mean, it already is very controversial. I think he's going to try and find threat, help them come back to the table and thread, a, a, you know, find a better solution. Yeah. I think we need to be a little bit careful too, because we don't know how much influence Pete has had, because this is, Basically, the directive has come from the Texas Federal Highway, you know, office, essentially, you know, the administrator has said, okay, we're going to, you know, we're asking you to pause this. Um, now, now, no, we're asking you, <laughs> you know, they're not demanding, they're asking, because Texas, you know, has the ROD that they can, they can move forward. Um, but it's, it's just, it's, it's something that you don't see, you know, the feds don't usually step in after they've agreed to, you know, what is there and, there is a memorandum, even though that Texas signed off on the record of decision, there is a memorandum of understanding with Federal Highway on this project. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting in that regard. But um, yeah, you, you don't usually see this. I mean, you know, once a record of decision has been issued, the project goes forward. I mean, that's, that's the way, you know, design considerations are made and the public still has input into that. And there's still a process there, but you know, the project itself is once that record a decision, you know, that project usually is, is going forward unless you see some sort of legislative action that would kill it. And that's that's very, very rare. And that that local FHWA official that they're usually states um, has the backing, the mm -hmm. absolute backing. He, he wouldn't have sent that letter unless he did have the complete backing of the secretary. Yep, exactly. One last question um, that I think comes up. Um, you mentioned, one of you mentioned this in your talk that it, not everyone has access to a vehicle. So focus on building roads and so on means nothing to people that don't have a car. Equity means that people have access to the mode of transportation that they can either use or afford, correct? And, and what is done in a way of equity to ensure that people that are riding bikes, that are pedestrians and so on, are taken care of uh, in these decisions? Not, perhaps not this Houston, you know, let's put that aside. But in, we talk about equity in infrastructure, in transportation. What is that role of making sure that people have access to all forms of transportation? Well, I think it's always come down to funding. I mean, the, the reason this, this Houston project is the way it is, some claims, you know, have been made that we can't expand transit because we don't, we're not able to, we don't have the ridership and we're not able to maintain it or, you know, it's that sort of thing. So, you know, if you come along with the American Jobs Plan or some sort of form of it, and all of a sudden there's money for transit, you know, it now becomes a more viable option. So I think, you know, with a lot of agencies, you know, they try to promote the multimodal use, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to funding. There's um, the other thing I wanted to just make sure, they publish a draft environmental impact statement. It's a big pile of paper. Everybody has an opportunity to take shots at it and they have to show that they've addressed all of those comments. They did that. So unfortunately, you know, they, and they got through all of that and still said, this is this this is the solution. I mean, the same organization, Text said it. Uh, so <laughs> there was no there was no scrutiny like that. And I think some of the things that the city came up with were there are no connections. Uh, they didn't they took care of the through, but not the to and from or the local access and circulation. So I think they have to, you know, I I think it would be in their in everybody's interest to take a closer look at some of those things. 
maybe cut down on the footprint um, and think about some of these things. Um, and that's I, what the independent um, study said as well. Can we, if everyone wouldn't mind, just if we go over just a minute or two, I, I think Glenn has an interesting question. Glenn, uh, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question, I think it's an interesting one. You know, why are we always looking at the uh, structural way of, of uh, solving problems, building roads, building dams, you know, putting concrete into the ground, when we can maybe change, use non-structural ways of changing our behavior or finding other ways to accomplish the same goals without having to destroy the environment and, and cause all these social, permanent social dislocations and such. I'm just, you know, just have a little bit more emphasis on maybe different alternatives that aren't as harmful to us. I think you've got, you know, you've got a lot of priority. You've got a lot of you know, the situation of you've got some lobbies out there, you know, definitely, you, you, the, you know, you're, you've got a construction industry lobby that, you know, we're talking jobs, 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 right? So, you know, with the, with the, you know, construction piece of it. So you know, when we're building physical infrastructure, we're pretend, you know, that's, people think of that as, you know, that's the job creator, you know, we're, we're putting people or putting these companies to work, you know, but, um, but the, the non, um, you know, physical infrastructure could create jobs as well. You know, it's a, it's a good point, but I do think, you know, it really, when you see stuff like this, people think, okay, well, we got to go out there and we actually got to build something because we got to put people to work building something so i think but so i think you do have a strong lobby for that and that's why that's one of the reasons why i think you know, when you see something like this people think of a build issue because they think oh build job creation right there and i'll just say have you ever been to the houston astrodome or i mean the if you've ever seen the houston astros guess who their major sponsor is in their stadium and ron Mm -hmm. Right. And, and Texas doesn't want to see roads and cars and gas go anywhere. Right. That's the, that is their economy. Dad works for Enron, right? So philosophically, it, it, it takes a culture shift away from that. And it is so much a part of the jobs that they have right now, the system that they have. Um, I'm good, bad, or indifferent. Whole communities are the same. So yeah, yeah. It, it's be, it would require a culture shift. I think the more people move, like, I was shocked when uh, the the Dakota Access Pipeline is deciding to say, you know, pull back. But also, their product isn't going anywhere. Eventually, this product is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> but it's going to take some. It's I think that's probably a good topic for a whole other webinar. Um, <laughs> Laura, do you want to take us out tonight before we? Uh... Yep, we'd happy to. I. Every time we have a, one of these webinars, I learn so much and I get that much more amped up about the importance of this plan and of the importance of the DOT transportation departments across the country. It's not just the federal offices, it's the state offices too and the regional initiatives. Um, on a side note, I would love to explore a future program on um, urban uh, kind of how to, how to set up cities in ways that are healthier. Um, and um, I bring this up because I, I, my father-in-law works for the um, Salvation Army in Lowell, Massachusetts. And tonight um, I went over to their house uh, just to say hello and find out what, how his day was. And um, he told some horrific stories about the neighborhood where the Salvation Army is. And he goes, it's just a concrete slab. And when you have the heat of the weather that we're having right now, um, all the bad stuff happening in the streets, and these aren't bad people, they're in a bad situation. And it just, I, I would love to have a webinar on that. So anyway, that's my, my pitch for the future. I wanna thank everybody for their time and being here at Build the Era. If you have not joined our Slack um, or want to join our Slack, please, uh, please uh, send an email to buildtheera at gmail.com. Um, you can also request to have a picture of my dog Daisy sent to you, and uh, we would be happy to do that as well. So uh, thank you all for your time. Thank you.